Hello, my name is Michael McLennan, and welcome to COVID Matters, the podcast produced by COVID Aid. In each episode, we speak to experts, including those with lived experience, about the key issues facing those affected by the pandemic. In the latest episode of COVID Matters, we find out about the Listen Project, which recently received more than £1 million in funding from the National Institute for Health Research and is led by Professor Fiona Jones. She's the Professor of Rehabilitation Research at St George's University of London and Kingston University and is the founder and CEO of Bridges Self Management. In recognition that each person with long COVID can experience markedly different symptoms, the Listen Project will work in partnership with patients to design and evaluate a package of self management support that can be tailored to individual needs. I spoke to Fiona in detail about this work and I hope you find this conversation as fascinating as I did. I'll be back afterwards with some details about both the project and the charity. It's really great to welcome you to the podcast, Fiona. Um, it'd be great to begin by uh, finding out a bit more about your own background and how uh, you got involved in the Listen Project. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm Fiona Jones and I'm Professor of Rehabilitation Research at St George's and Kingston University. Um, but my background is I started off in a clinical setting working as a physiotherapist and I worked as a physiotherapist um, became interested in in mainly working with people with quite complex conditions such as stroke and brain injury and other um, neurological conditions that are also progressive like MS and Parkinson's disease and I worked in lots of different settings I worked in community settings in intensive care and I think it was when I worked in the community settings that I started to really get the sense of the power of people's resourcefulness, their ideas, their creativity. And I began to think about whether I could do some research. Um, I started to, like many people do with a master's, and then I went... Oh, I think I'd be maybe just start yeah, that. No, the I had... post came, didn't it? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. So, yeah, I think it's a line uh, about you starting to do your own research. Yeah, so yeah. it was when I was working with people in their own homes that I started to see the questions evolve, really, different types of questions about why is it that some people really have that sort of resourcefulness and creativity and ideas and, and manage life, everyday life, with what was often quite severe disability and, you know, really challenging circumstances. So I started to think that it wasn't to do with my skills as a physiotherapist. It was actually more to do with the person themselves, their family, the support they'd had. And so I went down the route that lots of people do, which is to do a master's. And then I did a PhD and that's what set me off the path in terms of research. I've now worked in university for a number of years and I did lots of teaching like many people do teaching different healthcare students but my main interest now is around uh, an approach which is a sort of personalized form of self-management support and I've worked um, my research then evolved into an approach called Bridges Self-Management. And then about seven or eight years ago, I set up a social enterprise, which for people that don't know is a not-for-profit, a little bit like a charity, where we could actually do more of these types of projects, but also look at how to support people uh, who are living with other conditions. So not only stroke and brain injury, but looking at other um, areas such as you know people going through major trauma, um, going through um, different cardiac problems, all sorts of different experiences. And I now work in a job where I run the social enterprise, Bridges Self-Management, and I also work in my academic role. So I do two jobs, but they both overlap all the time. So I'm sorry, that's a long explanation, but it sort of gives you a bit of background. I'm sure you're going to ask more questions anyway, Michael. Uh, yes, most definitely. <laughs> and I, I, I was, so what was it from that that kind of led to the Listen Project? Um, I think it was, I mean, like everybody, um, you know, at the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of uncertainty, fear, anxiety, you know, 
I mean, I come from a healthcare background, but I, you know, many of my healthcare colleagues, people working in research felt this, but I tried to focus on, okay, the research that we've done before, which was actually when we really explored people's experiences and helped to understand their experiences through that could evolve some really helpful interventions. Um, and our focus is also specifically on the care that people receive. Um, and so the LISTEN project, um, which I guess is a good name because it's all about listening to people who have experienced long COVID, is about developing um, a way that healthcare professionals can support people with long COVID. And it's, it sounds strange, but it's specifically about the behavior of the healthcare professionals. I think everybody is very quick to think about what do we need to do to somebody? You know, what can we give them? What uh, you know, technical procedure can we do? But this is not what LISTEN is about. This is about providing space, time, tailored support by rehabilitation professionals for people living with long COVID. And there's two aspects to the project, which I'm sure you'll ask me about. But what we wanted to do was to take the success that we'd had in other conditions, stroke, brain injury, multiple sclerosis, other conditions, and then co-design a version of that approach of Bridges to people with long COVID. And in terms of um, the other work, I, I think it's, it's really interesting from the sense that self-management is a concept that people long COVID have experienced in a kind of personal sense, perhaps, you know, potentially without the support of healthcare providers. So I was wondering in terms of this sort of self-management that uh, you've helped in terms of other conditions, what that's looked like and what the benefits have been. Yeah, I think it's it's a shame that it's called self-management because uh, within Bridges, we're not that keen on the term, strangely. We're sort of mm. stuck with it because I think when we've, with all of our qualitative research, often when we ask people about self-management, they say, well, we're just expected to do things on our own. But it's really not about that. Um, what it's looked like, and this might seem an odd concept, but it's really about providing a therapeutic space. And by that, I mean really authentic listening, picking up on what people's needs are and what's important to them, really listening to their story, and then together bringing your ideas and your creativity together to work out what your rehabilitation might look like. And when we when you ask what it what does it look like actually it's it's not about what it looks like it's what it sounds like because there's much less control and directiveness from the healthcare professionals and much more time exploring and working in partnership and a lot of these words are banded about and they become a bit cliche because if you ask healthcare professionals they would all say they work in a person centered way but this is using specific strategies and language that's been developed over a number of years. And a lot of that has been co-designed with people living with complex long-term conditions. So the training that we deliver to healthcare professionals is also co-delivered with people with those complex long-term conditions so that the power of their stories is often what helps the healthcare professional to sort of shift their approach. Um, and a colleague of mine talks about bridges being a little bit like a dance because the healthcare professional has to take a step back to then allow the patient and their ideas to come into that space. So I don't know whether that helps at all, but it sort of gives a sense. It's not a one thing. It's more of a way of interacting and a way of working. And I'm wondering for some healthcare professionals, I can imagine that that's quite a change of mindset potentially. So I was wondering what is the sorts of experiences that people have had in the past and how it's affected them? Yeah, I think it was our work in, uh, with people with brain injury that that where well, we learned the most because healthcare professionals would say things like, you know, we haven't got the time to work in this way. You know, people with brain injury are not able to cognitively participate in this process. You know, we have to tell them what to do. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, you know, not everybody said it in that way, but 
essentially what we started to see play out was the interaction between the healthcare professional and the patient actually becomes more rewarding and healthcare professionals see more engagement and it feels almost a sort of cathartic feeling for the healthcare professional to think, well, actually, I don't have to come up with all the answers. So you see that gradual shift in how people work. And the other thing that might seem surprising to people is that working in this way actually can be more efficient because you're getting rid of all the things that you think are important as a healthcare professional. And your, your start point from the very first interaction is about what's most important and that person's story. So through that process, you find out ideas and you know potential directions for the rehabilitation, whereas Traditionally, what's happened is, is that people would be provided with rehabilitation towards the end of it. You'd be thinking about, OK, what's going to happen when this stops? Whereas actually with the bridges approach, it starts right from that first interaction. So the, the shift and the, the sort of the collaborative working starts much earlier in the process. Hopefully that makes some sense to you. No, it, cer it certainly does. And I think one of the. Uh, reasons why it's of real interest in regards to long COVID is so many people with long COVID have been involved in pushing for treatment and research and rehabilitation and, and trying to find ways of um, supporting themselves but others as well in similar circumstances. Mm. I think it's, uh, sorry if I might just say, I think it's um, what what I find really fascinating about this area is that everybody I've spoken to has, you know, there are some similarities, but there are also real differences. So to think that we're going to develop this one size of rehab intervention that will meet the needs of everybody with long COVID is, is, is not right. And so that what this approach does is it, it allows for the individual needs of each person um, in a much more sort of tailored way, because I think there, you know, some people may benefit from doing some respiratory exercises or thinking about their sleep or thinking about the things that motivate them. But everybody, their start point will probably be different and their ideas will be different. Their experiences will be different. So that's what this project is about. It's not an easy thing to test in a in a clinical trial, I have to say. No, I was going to say with the, the range of symptoms and I guess there's also kind of wider issues to do with awareness of long COVID as well. Yeah. That are things for you to kind of navigate around. Um, in terms of the project, it'd be really good to know about um, the kind of what the primary key stages of it are, where you're currently at and yeah, what you're up to. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, we, we got the notification early July that we've been successful. And this was our third go. Um, but this was the first time there'd been a call specifically around non hospitalized people with long COVID. So as we did our third application, we felt it was much more aligned to what we wanted to do. So fortunately, we were successful. But we have to start straight away. So we started August the 1st. But we'd already started. And the first stage is the co-design aspect of it. So we're working with a charity called Diversity, um, so, excuse me, a social enterprise called Diversity and Ability, that because we very much wanted to reach out to a long COVID community uh, from very diverse backgrounds, you know, people with all sorts of different experiences. And that co-design work package is already happening you know we've we've hopefully getting the ethical approval this week we'll start with some meetings with people with long covid we'll explore the priorities we'll look at existing resources look at how they want them to be shaped for people with long covid but specifically about the training uh, for healthcare professionals that all needs to be done within the next six months and then we start the trial is up and running within about, uh, by about February, March time. And we will have 24 rehabilitation teams that will receive training and then start to recruit people with long COVID that are in the community. And people can self-refer to 
the listen project it doesn't need to be something that a healthcare professional suggests that you um, are recruited to our sites are going to be across england and wales so you do need to sort of make sure that you have a site near you to be able to be recruited into the study um, but the whole project will be completed within two years um, there will be a battery of measures, as you'd imagine, when people are recruited into the trial, and then they will, hope, well, they will consent first, and then they will be allocated either to the intervention or to the control group. And the control group will be monitored, but they won't re receive the rehabilitation intervention, which always makes me feel sad. But hopefully we'll learn from the process. Um, we hope by the end of the two years, we'll have a package of support that's ready to implement in the NHS. Um, that's my big optimistic goal <laughs> for this project. And can you tell me a bit more about the team that you're working with on this at the moment? Yeah, so um, I mentioned that I work between my university role and leading bridges. So I'm the chief investigator as part of my role, Kingston and St George's, and there are some researchers as a um, uh, speech and language therapist researcher, and there are qualitative researchers that are involved from the university. Cardiff University have um, responsibility for the clinical trial, through their clinical trials unit, and that part is being led by um, Professor Monica Busser. And um, but we have statisticians, a health economist, we have um, an implementation science expert from King's College, and we also have people with long COVID. So we have a um, co applicant with long COVID, but we also have um, a PPI group with people with long COVID. And as I said, we're working in partnership. Weirdly, we're working in partnership with Bridges Self Management as a social enterprise, but also diversity and ability for their specific expertise in the accessibility of, of everything we produce and deliver, because we want to have tools, resources, and access into this trial that is as accessible as it can be. Um, we don't want an intervention that's only good for people who are motivated and highly health literate. You know, we want something mm -hmm. that's has real sort of reach and accessibility across many different communities experiencing long COVID. Then I was wondering, from a personal perspective, one of the interesting things I think as well with long COVID is how the advocacy that people are doing um, has helped inspire other communities and other conditions. So I was wondering with the work that you've done previously and with the kind of amazing range of skills and experience that you have, um, how those have informed your work and how you might hope that working with people long COVID can inspire other work in the future. Yeah, I mean, when I did the work in brain injury, I felt if we could get it right for people with brain injury, um, then maybe there's a chance that we could get this approach working for other people. But having talked to people with long COVID and really immersed myself as much as possible because I haven't experienced it, but like everybody, I know people, I've talked to people, um, and many healthcare professional colleagues have also experienced in long COVID. I think it's wrong to just think that we can just replicate, which is why it's important to really immerse ourselves in the experiences of people with long COVID because it is different. There are similarities. I feel that through my reading and understanding as well, this has really the whole concept of long COVID was a social movement because it was happening in advance of science and healthcare. You know, people were experiencing this, but actually very worried by what they're experiencing and healthcare professionals had a lack of knowledge and understanding. So it's almost as if science and healthcare needs to catch up with that social movement of people with long COVID. And um, I, I think because my background is has sort of evolved over a number of years. I don't see myself in an expert role at all. I see myself as somebody that, um, a bit like Bridges, you know, providing space and time to really understand and that authentic story and ideas and experiences is what will help to drive 
this. And I'm very confident that people with long COVID that are involved in this project will hopefully evolve out into a group. You know, we have our PPI group already, but the people that go through the co-design, I really hope that we build a little community that, you know, that we remain very, very involved with the project right the way through the two years. And then I guess there's also seems to be more of a shift from the way in which medicine was practiced in the past in healthcare to be generally more patient focused. Mm-hmm. Um, so is that something that you also hope that this sort of work can inspire that and kind of more general approach of listening more to people who are seeking help and support? Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, I've already mentioned it already that most people would say they do work in a very patient-focused, person-centered way. But my question is always, what does it look like and what does it sound like? Um, If you were looking, you know, if you walked into an interaction, what would I be hearing and what would I be seeing? But also, what does it feel like for that person? And it's not, which is why reflection is a very critical part of practitioners working in this way is to be very honest and reflective about their language and and how they how they draw patients in and also how they really listen to their ideas i mean there's lots of times obviously where as a patient i've been in the same position i'm sure you have where you don't want to be asked your opinion you want to be you want to be treated you know particularly <laughs> you don't want to be asked all the time what do you think here so I think it's we see this approach as being um, a continuum and, you know, for every person, it's about having your, you know, your antennae out, as I said, for their ideas and to slowly help that person build more confidence in their own capability. In terms of uh, a, a final question, for those people who are listening, whether those are people with long covid Healthcare providers, obviously, it can be one and the same thing sometimes. Um, are there ways in which people can get involved and provide support? Yeah, thank you, Michael. There's, um, we have a dedicated email called listen at cardiff.ac.uk. And there's a way to register your interest in the study. Now, it might be that you just want to be on a mailing list to find out about the study, or it might be that you want to be a participant in the trial once we're ready. Um, And I think we just encourage anybody to get in contact to register their interest. There is also another, um, there's various boxes you can tick on the register your interest. And there is a register of interest to be involved in the co-design as well. Um, That's starting now. Um, And one thing I'm incredibly grateful to yourself and your group and other people that have contacted me is that people have actually come to us in advance of us reaching out to people. And I think what that does is it really shows how I'm really hoping that this um, resonates with people as a project, but also that I think that the people I've spoken to have said that they can gain a lot from being involved in the research as well. You know, it actually makes them feel as if there's a purpose to their experiences as well. And I think that that's not for everybody. But I think, you know, if you've if you're in any doubt, um, do please register your interest. Or um, we're launching our Twitter account next week because we hope to have the ethics application. So we'll have a Twitter account, which I'll send you and you can you can let people know about. But also... Um, direct message me and my twitter handle is at jones and then f-i-o thanks so much to fiona for her time i'm glad to say that following the podcast recording covid aid was asked to join the steering group for the listen project so we'll look to update you as it progresses the new twitter profile that she mentioned is the listen proj which is the listen p-r-o-j if you haven't heard of us, COVID Aid is the new UK charity dedicated to helping all those adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to help anyone who's struggling but may not have found the correct resources or support system to help. By building an empowering, caring community, we provide a safe space where people's voices can be heard and where you can gain access to support that is specific to your needs. 
we'd love to have you as part of our community. So please visit coveredaidcharity.org. That is coveredaidcharity.org. We'll be back soon with our next episode. And until then, please take care.